their time in fighting that. So the one thing they will just take away from this is while a government of the left isn't looking very stable, they're already in fighting and they're not even in government. And that, that is where they really need to make sure this doesn't happen again. For National won't be subtle. Last election, they ran campaigns to remember the ads with the rowboats, one with all these people in blue rowing in the one direction, or the other, yeah, they all had different colours and directions. There was a I theme know- issue with that, wasn't there, I seem to recall? <laughs> no, no, the theme issue was other, was elsewhere, wasn't oh, it? Oh, was that a previous one? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I interrupted yeah. you. So, but, you know, if I was Stephen Joyce, I'd be throwing out what ads were, they were planning to run for this election and just grabbing those ones from the last election again because that's the part that's open. Now, we shouldn't overly dramatise. You know, it's two days of negative headlines. If it fades away, not too much damage is done. But... If it is a deliberate decision by the Greens that they want to be reminding urban Liberal voters that you need to vote Greens to stop New Zealand first being too dominant in government, then it's going to carry on. Thank you very much. That's Kiwi Blog founder and commentator David Farah and, of course, uh, Linda Clark and Alan Blackman, the guests on the panel. Let's get to a story about alcohol. Uh, it is Friday. Of course, people will be... Do you know it's funny in Christchurch now in the supermarkets on a Friday night, all you see are high-vis and safety boots in the beer section. Uh, that's happening a lot more, and, and a lot more in the IPA beer section, I might say, too. So hard on the heels of the really disappointing news, if you heard the programme yesterday, that New Zealanders are lazy. This was about the steps issue. Apparently... Uh, we walk fewer steps each day than the fattest nation in the world, the US. Well, now the list of the countries where people consume the most alcohol are out. No, we're not in the top ten. So topping the list for the most alcohol consumed per person is Lithuania. And New Zealand comes in at 37, and our friends across the ditch in Australia are ahead of us at 26th place. Now, the list was compiled averaging out annual litre consumption, and we in New Zealand consume just over 10 litres per person. Aussie was a litre more and the UK was ninth equal in the list with Slovakia, Latvia and Hungary. In fact, a lot of the countries in the top ten were Eastern European. Alan, are you surprised by this given all the publicity and media coverage we get about you know, being a booze-soaked nation? Yeah, I've got to say I was. And as as you said, all of the um, nations on the list are European except for South Korea and soon to come the UK I guess, which mm. isn't part of Europe anymore. But um, uh, the the one that really struck me is where's France in all of this? Um, I think we're sort of um, classified as being a booze-soaked nation, but I think the French are supposedly renowned for you know having wine with absolutely everything, and they weren't there surprisingly. But, but um, Linda, you know, well maybe this is the um, it's not about um, it's you know it's that thing about it's not what we're drinking, it's, it's how, how we're, drinking. we're drinking, and mm. perhaps that's where where the French thing is. I mean, are you surprised that we're not on on that list, Linda? Uh, yeah, I was surprised actually. I was. I mean, I guess I don't know. You know, when when you travel, you just don't see drunkenness on the street in the way that you see it in New Zealand and mm. Australia. Yeah, true. I mean, so I was. Yeah, I was really. I was really surprised. And what about South Korea in there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I just thought that the, the, the well, it's per head of population, obviously, is how they did it. But um, yeah, little old New Zealand at um, at thirty seventh place on the list was amazing. We so had you've a... given us all permission to go yeah. away and have a nice class cleansing ale. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> I mean, to that. It's not what we're drinking; it's how yeah. we're drinking. Thanks very much, you two. Have a fantastic weekend. Have a great holiday, Linda. Thank you, um, Alan Blackman, Lan- Linda Clark, and next is John Campbell with Checkpoint. Kia ora everyone, tonight we have the latest of course on the weather, the whiteouts, the floodings, thousands still without power during let's face it what is winter weather. So we ask should our infrastructure be holding up better? The future of disgraced MP Todd Barclay, will he keep avoiding Parliament, not to mention the media, until the election when he stands down? And if he does, is it fair that he keeps getting paid? His salary, 180 jobs to go from Otago University, that will have a big impact in Dunedin. And the Olympics, a fascinating problem that may change the games forever. Host cities are disappearing. They're too big and too costly to host. So where will they go? All of that and much more coming up on Checkpoint. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back after the news. RNZ News at 5. Kia ora, good afternoon. Ko Katrina Batanahou. 
Most of the roads across the central plateau have now reopened as conditions continue to improve following the polar blast. The Ruapehu District Council says things are starting to get back to normal with crews making good progress. Tom Furley reports. More than 350 holidaymakers stuck in hotels at the base of Mount Ruapehu can now carry on with their travel plans, with State Highway 4 now open from Taumiranui all the way to Whanganui. Access in and out of both Ohakuni and Waioru has also been restored, along with the road through Taihape a short time ago. Drivers travelling between Taupo and Napier can now use State Highway 5, which reopened shortly after 2 this afternoon. The Transport Agency, though, is warning motorists using these roads to take extra care. The desert road is still shut, and the Ruapehu District Council says it is likely to remain closed for another day or so. This is Tom Furley. Civil Defence says most roads in Wairarapa have reopened, but it's warning motorists to expect further closures as the sodden terrain is prone to slipping. Among the roads that have reopened is the route to Riversdale and Castle Point, about an hour east of Masterton. However, Martinborough remains cut off by flooding on State Highway 53. The next update on the roads will come at 5 tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the Manawatu Whanganui Regional Council is warning residents that the Turakina River may rise to alarming levels later this evening because of melting snow. The council's modelling showing shows the river peaking at 8.5 metres about 9 o'clock tonight, a metre and a half above the warning level. While it's not declaring a state of emergency, the Rangataike River uh, District Council says the farmers in the Koitiati, Koitiata area should move their stock and people wishing to leave the area should do so before dark. Lines company Powerco says more than 4,000 of its customers remain without electricity across the central North Island. A spokesperson says there's a chance the number will continue to decrease tonight with crews working through until 9.00. Power to Waioru and Taihape has just been restored, although outlying areas will take longer. Motorists blocked by a fire on a truck carrying hazardous materials are frustrated that trucks were put at the front of the queue when the Picton Christchurch Highway reopened this afternoon. Firefighters were called to the blaze on State Highway 7 about 8 o'clock this morning and nearby Boyle Village was evacuated as a precaution. The road reopened at 2 o'clock this afternoon. One motorist, Karen Kelty, says trucks were waved ahead of motorists, which wasn't fair on travellers during the school holidays. Ms Kelty says her family is supposed to be travelling to Nelson on holiday but have been stuck for more than four hours. And all the trucks got to go through and they've parked at the front so they get to go first. I thought it was a bit rough really. We've all got places to go. You know, they should be behind us because, you know, we can naturally travel faster than them. Karen Kilty says there are hundreds of cars stuck in traffic but she's relieved some vehicles are now moving. The Union for Otago University Workers says proposed cuts to 182 full-time support staff positions will not, will not be good for Dunedin. The university held meetings with staff today at its campuses in Dunedin, Christchurch and Wellington to announce the proposal. Otago employs 2,300 full-time general staff and its support services have been under review since 2015. The Tertiary Education Union spokesman Sean Scott says although the university hopes to save $16 million a year from the cuts, that's money that won't be spent in Dunedin City. That is money that's not necessarily being spent in the same way within the community, but also obviously has a huge impact on the individuals and their families and the communities they live in as well, um, taking, taking those salaries out of, out of circulation. Sean Scott from the Tertiary Education Union. The father of an Ashburton man who was strangled with a computer cord by his girlfriend of just seven weeks says he's been living a nightmare since his son was killed. Zaria J. Sampson, who was 25, was today sentenced to six years and three months in prison for the manslaughter of 30-year-old Corey James Protos in 2014. Outside the High Court in Christchurch, Corey's father, Jim Protoss, said his family was disgusted that the original charge of murder had to be downgraded to manslaughter. He said justice had not been served for Corey. Our lives changed forever on the 28th of April 2014 when we found out our whole while on holiday in Phuket via Facebook comments that our son had been brutally murdered in Christchurch. Our beautiful son has gone forever, brutally murdered, without even a chance to defend himself. 
Jim Protoss says he hoped Zaria Sampson got help. The police in London are investigating four suspected acid attacks in less than 90 minutes. They say two moped drivers threw a corrosive substance in people's faces during a string of robberies in Stoke Newington and Hackney. One of the victims has suffered what the police have described as life-changing injuries. There's been a significant rise in acid attacks in Britain, prompting calls to restrict the sale of corrosive substances, which can be bought easily over the counter. It's five and a half past five. In sport, the Highlanders coach Tony Brown is welcoming the return of the All Blacks loose forward Liam Squire for the business end of the Super Rugby season. Squire, who's been out of action for more than two months with a broken thumb, returns for the Highlanders' final regular season match against the Queensland Reds in Dunedin tonight. With fellow All Blacks Aaron and Ben Smith rested for tonight's game, Ben is happy, Brown is happy to have Squire back. He's going to be a little bit rusty around game fitness, but um, you know the the way that he plays, you know the way that he inspires our team. It's just going to be great to have him on the field, and you know I think he'll inspire the rest of the boys to to perform really well. Tony Brown's side is already through to the playoffs with a quarter final against the Crusaders or South Africa's Lions looming next week. Roger Federer will resume his push for an unprecedented eighth Wimbledon tennis title when he takes on Czech Thomas Burdich in their semi-final on centre court overnight. Fifth-ranked Federer is the highest seed remaining after Andy Murray and Novak Djokovic were ousted in the quarter-finals. The Swiss star is on a seven-match winning streak against Burdich, who has not beaten him since 2013, and Federer has yet to drop a set at this year's championships. The American Sam Querrey plays seventh-seeded Croatian Marin Cilic in the other semi-final. And New Zealand cyclist George Bennett is aiming to further improve his position in the 13th stage of the Tour de France overnight. Bennett's in ninth place, four minutes and 24 seconds behind the new leader, Italian Fabio Aru. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, Art Deco Fever. Glenn Pickering talks about preparing for Napier's Art Deco Winter Weekend. That's if winter hasn't derailed it. Country Life gathers some pine nuts. Expect some pesto pack goodness there. The Music 101 team continues its search for the best song of 2017. And we have a sonic tonic dedicated to spin. As in, the spin I'm in, rather than spinning fake news. On nights, because what goes around comes around. After the news at 7 on RNZ National. Met service weather through to tomorrow midnight. Northland showers mainly in the west, easing this evening. Auckland, Coromandel, Bay of Plenty and Taupo remaining rain, clearing this evening, but skies remaining mostly cloudy. Waikatu to Waitomo, also Taumirinui, fine breaks increasing. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, rain with heavy falls and snow above 600 metres, easing to showers from the south this evening, increasing fine spells tomorrow. Taranaki to Wellington, also Taihepe and Wairarapa, showers gradually easing today and clearing tomorrow morning. Marlborough and Canterbury, areas of cloud and isolated showers, mainly about the coast, clearing overnight and becoming fine. Nelson Buller, Westland and Fiordland, mainly fine, however isolated showers for Westland and rain for Fiordland later tomorrow. Otago and Southland, fine apart from a few showers in Southland tomorrow night. And for the Chatham Islands, which has just disappeared on me, <laughs> occasional showers. Uh, it's eight, it's coming up to nine minutes past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, thanks, Katrina. Well done for finding the Chathams. <laughs> Uh, tonight on the program, job losses at Otago University. Todd Barclay still has a job, but what's he doing in it? Venue losses for the Olympics. The party too big and too expensive for anyone to want to host. And the Jensens have left New Zealand. All of that and more between now and 6.30. But first, last night, the central North Island was essentially a no-drive zone. Every major road around Mount Ruapehu was closed. State Highway 1 was closed for over 100 kilometres. Tonight, roads are reopening, although the desert road remains closed with snow still being cleared. Power was cut too to about 10,000 homes overnight. Power Coast says more than 4,000 are still without electricity tonight and some face a second night in the cold. It is cold too. Here's Tom Furley with the latest. Access to and from the town of Taihepe was cut off and the power has been out since yesterday morning. The owner of the Rusty Nail Backpackers, Jenny Caldwell, says she's had to be resourceful. Getting the fires all going and collecting water from what was left in my tanks and things and then melting snow in pots on top of the fireplaces. 
so that can be used for um, toilets and things. Um, and just making sure that you keep everyone warm and, yeah, just warm and fed and fueled. While she only had one stranded guest basking in front of the fire last night, she says others aren't so cosy. There is other motels in Taihapi and some of them I don't think have got heating because well, motels don't have fireplaces in their rooms and with no power they won't have any um, heating. So I was speaking to a family last night and they're keen on moving up to my place because of the fires. We just bumped into them when they were there and they just said it was just so miserable. They actually went and sat in their car to keep warm yesterday. Truck driver Steve Tanifa was travelling down the Napier Topo Road when he found he couldn't go any further. But despite the delays, he's in good spirits. I knew where the Rangitaiki Tavern was, so I quickly hooked in there and just come in here thinking, well, oh, we'll only be here for a little bit. And no, yeah, we've been here ever since yesterday, so... Good little place to stay. Two fires going, good yarns with the other truck drivers that showed up here who we were on the road as well, and that's nah, awesome. 120 guests were stuck at the Scotel Alpine Resort at Whakapapa Village overnight. Its general manager, Rebecca Galgano, says it's been a big couple of days. Well, most of our staff live on site, so um, that's pretty OK, but we have the staff who live off site that can't get to work, so everyone that's still here on site is working double shifts and morning to night and banding together. I've chefs out there shoveling snow. I have housekeepers working in the restaurant. With food running short, an escorted convoy this morning dropped supplies off to the resort and to the Chateau Tongarero next door. Its hotel manager, Brad McGlynn, says now the roads have reopened, its 250 stranded guests can continue on with their travels. Most times we get blizzard the last, you know, probably eight hours, eight, nine hours, and the road may be closed for a little bit of time, and then they open it up. This has uh, been quite a substantial event for us, and uh, yeah, it was for a lot of the guys, it was a new experience. They had a lot of learnings from this. So it was good fun. But no, everyone pulled together, all our um, you know, local resources, so it was very heartening. The Ruapehu District Council says things are starting to get back to normal, with a number of the central North Island roads, including the Napier Topo Road, reopening this afternoon. However, its Chief Executive and Civil Defence Controller, Clive Manley, says motorists still need to be careful tonight and tomorrow. In the early hours of the morning, the temperature would have uh, gone back to freezing again. So the, the roads will be extremely icy in the early hours of the morning. So even though the road appears to be clear, people really should still drive with extreme caution. Clive Manley says it's not just motorists who need to take care. St John have also been treating people who've slipped on frozen footpaths. For Checkpoint, Tom Feely. Let's go to the wadded up now, where a completely washed out bridge has been stopping people getting into and out of Martinborough in the south of the region. So the town's businesses have today been operating with skeleton crews. For those desperate to go in or out, they can take back roads, but that adds a lot of time to what is normally a 15 minute drive, roughly, to State Highway 2 in Featherston. Our reporter Jacob McSweeney has been out talking to locals to find out how they're coping. The owner of the Oh My Goodness Cafe on the main road in Martinborough, Gina Richards, got wind the town might be cut off, so instead of going home to Featherston last night, she stayed in town. Knowing that I wouldn't be able to get in into town this morning to, to open the business, so I didn't take that risk. There's always places like to stay in that, so that, it's not a major. Stayed at a friend's house around, around the corner, so it worked out well. She says she's heard of disruptions everywhere. It's been horrific. Bridges have been closed. Quite a bit of flooding. Fire brigade have been out. Yesterday went out eight times to various, like there was a house fire, also flooding, that people had to be moved out of their homes. Unlike her boss at the Oh My Goodness Cafe, barista Lara Wishart didn't manage to get into town from Masterton before it was cut off last night. Checked the roads about 5.30 and they decided to close the last road at 6, so I knew that I wouldn't make it. Uh, so I had to stay at my parents' house and took the extra, extra long way this morning that I think took me about... 40 minutes to an hour longer than it should have. Across town, the pain in Kershaw's supermarket and general store was down seven staff. That meant closing the general store side of the business and moving all staff to the supermarket to serve customers. Floor manager Aaron McKissick said it's the roading woes that are stopping people from getting into work. 
just with the road closures, the flooding and the rivers being up, which just some of the staff from, from out of the region are struggling to get into, <laughs> into work. So taking the long way around, so there's only one road open at the moment, which is um, Western Lake. He says they're doing the best they can to prioritise the food and drink side of the business. The council's sort of struggling to give us any real ideas of when things are opening up at the moment, so we're just, just planning for the worst and just making sure that um, none of our customers starve to death, you know, so make sure we've got plenty of Plenty of food on the shelves and you know, plenty of beers in the fridge and keep everyone happy. The Martin Bra Hotel was only partially open because they were short five staff. The receptionist, Cathy Hutchison, says the restaurant will not open at all today, but they will be able to open the bar for pizza and snacks. We are having issues with staff. We're not able to open the restaurant tonight because our chef can't make it and also the bar manager is trying to get in at the moment so yeah the only way in and out of town is the east-west access road so it's quite a long detour. Davis Clark is a new resident of Martinborough having escaped the congestion of Auckland. It's fantastic, great community. And how are you finding the conditions? Look these conditions are none that I'm not used to, I've, I've experienced worse in Canada and America so uh, this isn't bad. It is what it is, you can't sweat the small stuff so get on with it don't you? Julie Ambury has lived in the town for three years. She says when the town is cut off like it is now, it's a bit like an island. There'll be a lot of farmers moving stock, I suspect. I do know one or two around the area. Yeah, and um, yeah, they'll just be focusing on making sure their animals are okay. And, and um, thankfully it's school holidays, so people don't need to worry about getting kids to school and, and that kind of thing. So they'll be doing what they usually do, <laughs> hunkering down. The Rural Support Trust says if the storm had come in a month's time, it would have hit farmers hard during lambing and calving. And there would have been stock losses. The Met Service says Wided Upper can expect showers to fade for the rest of the day and tomorrow will be cold but clear. In Martinborough for Checkpoint, Core Jacob McSweeney, Tenne. So we've seen widespread power outages and still roughly 4,000 homes without power. And we've seen slips causing major and prolonged road closures. Uh, still closed in the Manawatu and Waiweka gorgeous. In places, New Zealand's infrastructure is buckling under the pressure. Is that acceptable? Stephen Selwood is the Chief Executive of Infrastructure New Zealand. There are enormous challenges facing us, not only in terms of the growth pressures that we see in Auckland, but the resilience of our um, infrastructure networks right across the country and exposed every time when we come into you know, this spell of bad weather and they seem to be getting increasingly problematic as time goes on. Yes, it's interesting because we cover the weather and we get feedback from people saying, hey, well, what are you even talking about? It's winter, of course it's going to snow. And I guess the same thing could apply to infrastructure, right? Why is it that on a pretty bad but not historically bad winter's day, there are thousands of people without power? Yeah, well, it ultimately comes down to, you know, how much we're prepared to invest as New Zealanders uh, in the resilience of our infrastructure networks and you know that is a challenge we all have to, to pose ourselves. I mean is it acceptable in a modern society we were dependent on electricity increasingly more so for our communications and our mobility you know can we afford to just do the same old Kiwi should we write uh, kind of approach and you know I think and especially when you're looking forward into you know major change in climate uh, progressively over time um, you know the risks are getting bigger and more frequent uh, it's time for that sort of hard discussion to be had I think and, and what are the terms of the hard discussion in other words what do you think it should be leading towards well, look, ultimately, I think it comes down to uh, willingness to pay. You know, for example, we could um, uh, underground uh, electricity lines. The difference in overhead uh, electricity lines to underground is somewhere between four and ten times the cost, depending on the country uh, that you're trying to traverse. Um, and or you could have alternative, you know, uh, overhead wires in different locations to give you redundancy in your network. Um, we rely on one gas pipeline. Um, we could duplicate it. Um, so, you know, it, it also, I still come back to we have to have a grown-up discussion um, and, and the regulators and the service providers are the, are the people who have to lead this discussion um, about you know, how much are we prepared to pay. Um, or are we prepared to accept failure and, uh, and hopefully respond quickly? Um, the issues around housing beside uh, coastal areas. Uh, the Commissioner for the Environment has um, recently highlighted you know, lots of areas where infrastructure is at risk and um, there's a cost of relocation. 
So, so Stephen, resilience costs it, and, and we have to have the discussion about how much we're prepared to pay for it. Are we doing enough in the meantime? Look, I don't think we are. When I, when I look at what other international um, countries, and you know, as part of uh, what we do as, a, as an organisation is to compare New Zealand against other countries, and I go to places like Denmark, you know, it's got a similar sort of population to New Zealand, slightly, I think they're five and a half million. Um, they are building uh, bridges. They see Denmark as the bridge of Scandinavia to Europe, and they're building 20 kilometre bridges connecting Denmark to Sweden, and now they've got a tunnel under construction connecting Denmark to Germany. Now, it's primarily driven by an economic um, opportunity of creating Denmark as a bridge to Europe. Um, but, you know, by comparison, here we are in New Zealand in the same sort of time frame as they've done that. We've built the Waterview Tunnel. Um, you know, it just, we pale into insignificance uh, by comparison to what international countries are doing. And, of course, there's huge social and economic benefits in this, and, and we, we need to focus much more on the benefits uh, rather than our traditional Kiwi way of looking totally at the costs. Stephen Selwood, the CEO of Infrastructure New Zealand, we would love your feedback on how you think the infrastructure is standing up, and if the answer is not very well, how do you feel about paying more for more Resilience, you can text us 2101 or email checkpoint at radioNZ.co.nz. Let's head south, unless, of course, you live there. It's been a tough day for University of Otago staff at, campus, at campuses in Wellington, Christchurch, and, of course, and most particularly Dunedin. They were being told wide-ranging job cuts are being proposed for non-academic staff. Although staff have suspected for months jobs were on the line, they were surprised to learn just how many could go. Otago Southland reporter Lydia Anderson has more. About 600 staff gathered at Otago University today to hear the news that 182 full-time equivalent positions are on the line. Tertiary Education Union spokesman Sean Scott says staff were shocked so many positions could be lost. Once the announcement was made that um, 182 full-time equivalent um, jobs are proposed to, to be going on this review, um, I think there was a bit of shock through the room. It certainly went pretty quiet at that stage for a bit. In 2015, Otago undertook a cost-cutting review of its non-academic support staff and today's announcement was the outcome of that review. Mr Scott says it's the biggest shake-up he's seen in the last two decades. Restructuring and reducing the staffing levels by such a significant amount, in our view, has a likely impact that it's going to um, detrimentally affect you know, any one of those three things, you know, teaching, research or support for students, and there's a risk that it has a negative impact on all three. Mr Scott says the total number of staff affected could be much higher than the number signalled today. And he says although the university hopes to save $16.7 million a year from job cuts, it's not good for the city of Dunedin, which is already reeling from the loss of about 360 Cadbury worker jobs. That is money that's not necessarily being spent in the same way within the community. It also obviously has a huge impact on the individuals and their families and the communities they live in as well, um, taking, taking those salaries out out of circulation. But Dunedin Mayor Dave Cull said in a statement he's confident Dunedin won't be unduly affected by the job losses. Any job losses are upsetting and difficult for staff who will be affected by the announcement. However, the types of jobs in a community are regularly changing and developing, and it's quite possible the positions would be absorbed within the city. I understand the overriding expectation on the university, as a public sector organisation, that it runs as efficiently as possible. The university's Vice-Chancellor, Professor Harleen Hayne, says although the university had an operating surplus of $27 million last year, that has already been swallowed up by its new music and performing arts centre. She says today's announcement is about making the university's outdated management systems more efficient. What's happened is that we've sort of developed a, a very um, low local and somewhat inefficient system. So it's really about looking at our systems, um, not about our people. We've got fantastic people here, um, but some of our systems could probably use a bit of a refresh. Professor Haynes says she understands the proposal will have a huge impact on staff morale and support measures are already being offered. Staff morale is always at the forefront of everything that we do here at Otago. Um, one of the things that's unique to the Otago way is that it's always about people. So anything that we do that affects people is always something that we're very concerned about. 
If the cuts go ahead, the majority would be carried out by mid-2018. Staff have until August 25th to give feedback, and the union says it will start holding meetings with its members from next week. In Dunedin for Checkpoint, Lydia Anderson. 25 minutes past five. Just before we move on, we've just heard from NZTA that the Waiwaka Gorge, or one lane anyway, is open. There was a huge slip there, which they have cleared. That is the road, of course, between Gisborne and De Portiki, and there is a hell of a detour to get out of Gisborne if you're heading north, and that road is closed. So one lane open. They are hoping uh, to clear the other lane as quickly as possible. That just in from NZTA, and we thank them for that notification. Embattled National MP Todd Barclay is being told he must return to Wellington when Parliament resumes if he wants to keep getting paid. Last month, the Clutha Southland MP said he would not seek re-election in September amid a furore over allegations he secretly recorded a staff member in an electorate office. The MP, who's getting paid $165,000 a year, hasn't been seen in Parliament since he announced his departure and isn't responding to any media requests. But New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters is among those calling for him to return, saying if he's taking the public's money. He needs to do his job. Political reporter Benedict Collins has the story. Todd Barclay hasn't been seen in Parliament and has scrapped public appearances since he announced last month that he will stand down at the election after one term as MP for Clutha Southland. The Deputy Chair of the Education and Science and Primary Production Select Committees hasn't returned RNZ's calls or messages. He did respond to his local newspaper, Queenstown's Mountain Scene, but only via email and ignored many of their questions. There are four sitting weeks before the House rises for the election, and Mr Barclay is still collecting his $165,000 a year MP's salary. The National Party's senior whip, Jamie Lee Ross, who visited Todd Barclay this week, says no decision has been made yet about whether he'll return. Todd Barclay said that he is keen to be the MP for Clube Southland until the election, and he's doing that work. Any leave requirements he'll be discussing with me as the party whip uh, between now and the next sitting week of Parliament. The New Zealand First Leader, Winston Peters, says he feels sorry for Mr Barclay because he believes he was badly let down by his senior colleagues. But that said, you know, there's not one law for the National Party, it's different law for everybody else. If you're picking up a taxpayer's largesse for a job, you have to do that job unless you've got a darn good reason like illness or family bereavement or good reason not to be there. And the National Party should ensure he does that and start living up to the kind of standards they roughly impose upon everybody else when they're talking about taxpayers' money but apparently never about themselves. The executive director of the Taxpayers Union, Jordan Williams, says Todd Barclay chose not to resign, and if he wants to continue to collect his salary, then he must return to work. MPs are paid to be in Parliament when Parliament is sitting. I think given the circumstances, most New Zealanders would appreciate he probably did need some time to reflect or lick his wounds. But it's now been a few weeks, and uh, there's no reason why, if Mr Barclay says he wants to continue to be uh, an MP until the election, and be paid until December. The very minimum he should be doing is turning up to Parliament when it's called. But Jamie Lee Ross says it's his call as Chief Whip about which national politicians have leave. The bottom line is we have to maintain 75% of our MPs in the Parliament to cast our votes. I always maintain that we do have um, the numbers in the Parliament to cast our votes. That's my job and I'll continue to ensure that uh, any leave requirements for MPs complies with the standing orders. Winston Peters says that's a bad attitude to take. The problem here is you've got people like Jamie Lee Ross and others who at the whip level are saying, oh, 25% non-attendance rule, that we don't require him because uh, of that. Now, basically, again, Jamie Lee Ross, like the rest of his older colleagues, are saying to all of us, there's one rule for us, we're born to rule, we're the privileged group, we're not blessed bleached, and the rest of you can get stuck. Jordan Williams says MPs are given leave to represent New Zealand abroad or on official business. Leave isn't there for an MP to effectively take garden leave or hide from the media. That's not the purpose of it. He should be doing his job. If he's not prepared to come back, what do you think he should do? Oh, I think that the public need to quite rightly continue to ask questions. The media need to continue to ask, where is Todd Barclay? You know, it's turning into a bit of a joke. At what stage do taxpayer representatives need to send out a search party. None of the Labour MPs contacted by RNZ would be interviewed. They said it was the National Party's mess and its job to clean it up. The House is in recess next week, but Parliament will resume the week after that. The $165,000 question is whether Todd Barclay will be there. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Benedict Collins. 
Checkpoint has repeatedly asked Todd Barclay for an interview. He doesn't even reply to say no, but we heard he was replying to written questions. So we sent 10. Do you intend to come back to Parliament for the last four weeks of the House sitting before the election? Do you intend to be attending select committee hearings between now and the election in September? How are you currently representing the people of Clutha Southland as their MP? Do you plan to give a statement or talk to the police in relation to their investigation into the alleged taping of a staff member in the Gore electorate office? What have you been doing since you announced you were standing down at the election as an MP? What are you most proud of achieving for your electorate in the time you have been an MP? Why have you chosen to stay on until the election and not resign immediately? Did you discuss your return or otherwise to Parliament with Jamie Lee Ross and Sarah Dowie when you met with them this week? Are you still using parliamentary travel and expenses? And last but not least, did you record a staff member or members without their knowledge at any time? We're yet to receive a response, but we're sure we will. With Checkpoint on RNZ coming up, who wants to host the Olympics? Not that many cities, apparently not that they're not exciting, but no one can afford them. And we're at the airport with the Jensen family as they return to the US with their appeal to stay in New Zealand still on the minister's desk. Nona is coming up with business. She's got a lot of pages with numbers on the desk. But first, with a time dangerously close to 5.30, here's Katrina Batten with the headlines. An Australian Green Party senator has resigned after failing to renounce his New Zealand citizenship. Scott Ludlam realised he's been ineligible to sit as a senator for the past nine years because he holds dual citizenship. The Australian Constitution disqualifies potential candidates from election to Parliament if they hold dual or plural citizenship. Mr Ludlam has apologised unreservedly for what he said was his mistake. Motorists are now able to travel through the middle of the North Island with most roads now reopen. All highways through the central plateau are open apart from the desert road where snow is still being cleared. Power has just been restored to Waiuru and Taihape townships but up to 4,000 homes across the central North Island are still without supplies. Power Co says crews are working hard but outlying areas may have to wait a bit longer. The Union for Otago University workers says proposed cuts to 182 full-time support staff positions will not be good for Dunedin. The university held meetings with staff today at its campuses in Dunedin, Christchurch and Wellington to announce the proposal. Motorists blocked by a truck fire which was carrying hazardous materials are frustrated trucks were put at the front of the queue after the South Island Highway reopened this afternoon. The blaze on State Highway 7 closed the roads for about six hours earlier today and the nearby village of Boyle was evacuated as a precaution. The Labour Party is pledged, pledging to roll back cuts to early childhood funding made by previous national-led governments and raise minimum requirements for qualified teachers if it's elected to government. The party's early childhood spokesperson Chris Hipkins said a Labour-led government would reinstate a subsidy rate for early childhood services where all teachers are qualified. Those are the headlines. I'm back at six o'clock. Thank you shortly. very much. Thank you very much. Not that shortly. Okay, 27, 27 minutes. minutes away. God, you're fussy. <laughs> Thanks, Katrina. Uh, lots of people giving us feedback on resilience, and I think this one sums it up really nicely. Spending more on resilience is easy to say, but the details are more complex. Yes, we need to spend, but where, how, and how much needs to be carefully considered. Ultimately, you can't make things fail proof, e.g., underground power cables might be more resilient in the eyes of some but they are also harder to repair if they do fail. Thank you for your feedback. We'll come back to some more of it later, but let's go to business news now. And I've got such a magnificent intro that I feel like I should read it out. <laughs> a survey has found most people think non-standard accounting measures can help shed light on a company's financial performances, but others think <laughs> they're just a way to cover up a poor result. Let's start, Nona, with non-standard <laughs> accounting measures. What, what, what they actually are. Who wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a very complicated report here. <laughs> well, so, I'm going to lean back. I'm going to lean back while you explain Alternative it. performance measures. And what are those, you might ask? Yeah, I did. You should, yeah, you did ask. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, people have heard these, potentially, they've heard these EBITDA, EBITDA, yeah. normalized earnings. People, what, what are these terms? Well, believe it or not, those who use these types of financial results to, you know, study companies. 88% of the people surveyed 
thought this was really useful information. Right. Yeah, they like this sort of non-standard right. measures of accounting to to see how a company is actually doing. But most other people, their eyes glaze over, have no idea what these things mean. So what is earnings Even before dark. interest, tax, amortization, financial instruments, or foreign currency? It could mean anything. And that's the thing. There is no standard of what these things mean. And, and, and so companies will throw this sort of stuff out. But then... And do they throw out the stuff that best suits their purposes? Does well, it, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, I it, mean, best it, suits their sales it, it, And everybody's different because, you know, for example, um, Sky City, they have, they, they have normalized earnings based on the run rate of... Um, of uh, their high rollers business. So they, they assume a win rate of, you know, 1.3 or just a ratio. It's a sort of a, but it's the, at least it's consistent. Other companies, you know, they just throw out an underlying earnings number and you're like, oh, well, what's in that? Oh, well, you don't really need to know. Actually, yes, we do. Uh, so a lot of companies are using these kinds of uh, numbers and non-standard measures. Non-standard measures, and some people think 88% think this is very useful, but about 12% think it's absolutely not useful, and it's really just there to add some uh, so who gloss. Decides? So who is sitting there saying, actually, let's get one measure so that it becomes meaningful across well, the world, or is no one having that? Conversation? We have one measure. It's yeah. called you know generally accounting uh, accepted accounting principles. Uh, GAP is what it's known as sh for short, and it includes things like net profit. Okay, so what's that bottom line? That's the one we usually report. Sometimes we report, you know, in our in our um, reporting of company results, we'll use other measures to give some context. But that's usually because the companies have provided that as a way of explaining, you say, a poor result. And let's use an example that we had this week. Zero is a really good example of that because they don't have a net profit; they're still no. not making a profit. Right. So they want to sell a whole lot of other stuff entirely. Right? Exactly, because they don't want people to focus on the fact that they don't make a profit. They want people to focus on the fact that they're moving towards a break-even position. And we hear that a lot with tech companies. This is one thing that they aim for, to move towards a break-even position. But, you know, a lot of companies uh, that are in growth mode spend a lot of money, and so they look at their underlying earnings. This is like before, uh, you know, they've paid their tax, of course, if they're making a loss, they're not paying tax necessarily. But, yeah, so there's all this non-standard accounting. Now, interestingly, we have a board called the External Reporting Board that looks after all of this stuff. And they did this survey to find out if people thought it was useful. And since people do find that it, it's useful, they're not going to work out what kind of standards they can bring in over time that will make these underlying earnings more standard. We'll see what happens. That's an interesting... Uh, yeah, it was. Interesting. Thanks, Nana. Yeah, Thank you for go. explaining that and beautifully explained. Uh, right, what happened on the markets at the end of the week? Well, oh, actually, quite a lot, oh, okay. as a matter of fact, yeah. Uh, global stocks hit an all-time high. Uh, following uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve, uh, Janet Yellen's testimony where she thought that maybe the U.S. economy wasn't going to grow as fast as Donald Trump thinks. Yeah. And as a result of that, the dollar kind of wavered a bit. And so our dollar held on to its overnight gains. It's really high. It's uh, 73.2 U.S. cents, 94.5 Australian and 56.5 British pence. On our index, the uh, NZX top 50 index, very high, not right off our, just off our high, all-time high, but really Asia is very strong. We rose about a half a percent by 39 points to 7,650. So pretty big week. Thank you, Nona. Have a fantastic weekend. And you. Thanks, Nona. We're going to stay with business, although it doesn't sound like business. One of the most fascinating conundrums of, in all of sport is playing out at the moment nowhere near a sports arena. It's the future of the Olympic Games. That they have a future is not in doubt. The question is where. In short, they've become too big, too expensive and too difficult for most cities to host. Now, Andrew Zimbalist is a sports economist who's been warning this would happen for many years. We'll meet him in a moment. But the IOC's response looks to be unprecedented. And the absence of cities bidding to host the Olympics, they're poised to award the next two Olympics to the only cities with their hands up, LA and Paris. And then what? Faultless. Absolutely faultless. Nadia Kamenech. Now what are the judges going to say about that? There's the smile. Montreal 1976 and what the judges said was among the most famous numbers in Olympic history. The crowd saw the scoreboard first. And 10 has gone on the board. That's perfection. And 
That is Olympic history for Nadia Comaneci. A perfect 10 on the uneven bars. 41 years on, many of us old enough to have watched it at the time will still remember that vividly. What Montreal remembers, perhaps more vividly, is the financial cost. It was not very well managed as a financial project. And uh, we had a, a fabulous stadium, but it, I think it cost more than all of the covered stadia in North America put together. Put together. Put together. That's Dick Pound of the IOC, also a Montreal resident. He was talking to CNN, and when CNN went out onto the streets, one number that people remembered was how long it took to pay off hosting the games. It took us 30 years to pay it off, and as a taxpayer, not too happy about that. 30 years for just over a fortnight, and that kind of debt is typical. There are exceptions. Some cities can manage. But as a general principle, and for 90% of the hosts... It doesn't make any economic sense whatsoever to throw a 17-day party and spend $20 billion and, and declare that you're doing something good for the economic development of the city. That's Andrew Zimbalist, an acclaimed sports economist and the author of Circus Maximus, the economic gamble behind hosting the Olympics and the World Cup. For a long time, his was a voice from the margins, his inconvenient truth about the high financial cost and low financial rewards of hosting the Olympics was largely ignored by cities like Rio. But now the figures are so telling, the Olympics are running out of cities that want to host them, and the IOC is clearly listening to that. Because this week, the IOC basically said, our business model is not working, we don't have enough cities that are willing, willing to bid. We're not willing to go out again in, in 2021 and have, have a selection or contest amongst cities to pick the 2028 winner because they're afraid that there aren't any other cities out there that can do it. Mm. Uh, and, and maybe there might be a city that stepped forward and said we want to do it, but that city would end up creating an economic disaster and further hurting the brand of the Olympics. So in order to avoid that embarrassment, they pick, they're picking two cities at once. Yes, it's the bird in the hand scenario. With Paris and L.A. the only cities willing and able to host the Games, the IOC, with a matter-of-fact pragmatism, is saying yes to them both. The only question is in which order. What this signals is that the days of multiple cities fighting for hosting rights is over. Remember the envelope being opened? Let's go back to 2009. Enjoying the crowd, watching the IOC announcement on a giant screen in Trafalgar Square. The International Olympic Committee has the honour of announcing that the Games of the 30th Olympiad in 2012 are awarded yeah! to the city of London. Like Nadia Comaneci in 1976, that scene too is now Olympic history. The cuter host is now very short. So the model isn't working, and they need a new model. It's, it's not going to. It won't work to tweak the old model. That's what, they tried to do that with Agenda 2020 back in 1984. So that's not going to be the solution. Uh, what they need is something drastically different, and that thing that's dra drastically different might be picking one city to be the permanent host. Some cities can do it, and they're most likely to be cities that have hosted before and retained the game's infrastructure intact. Incredibly, the stadium in Rio, and the Olympics were only there last year, is already in need of major repair. Upkeep is expensive. Los Angeles, though, that's a different story. Because they have virtually every single venue they need. They have a modern... Uh, transportation network, they have a modern uh, communications network and hospitality infrastructure and security infrastructure. Uh, and I think that their budget is, is actually a very sensible one, that they, they can host the Olympics probably even having, uh, having a modest surplus. Um, there, there would be some additional expense because the U.S. government would probably have to pick up about uh, $2 billion worth of security, so that would be a, a nationwide expense. But Los Angeles could do it. Los Angeles is also, by the way, their plan uses the uh, UCLA dormitories, the student dormitories mm. for the Olympic Village. Uh, there are very few places in the world that can do that. In the Paris plan, for instance, they're going to build the Olympic Village in Saint-Denis and then convert the Olympic Village into, into residential properties. 
um, it, they would never be able to bring the Olympics back to Saint Denis because the Olympic Village would be gone. It would be it would become housing. To understand what's involved, it's worth listing the numbers. Bloomberg has done great work here. Thank you, Bloomberg. Their list includes staging more than 300 events across some 30 sports in 17 days, housing 11,000 athletes and 5,000 coaches, finding 42,000 hotel rooms for Olympic officials and corporate sponsors. We mustn't forget them. Staffing almost 300,000 contractors and volunteers, supplying a 20-acre broadcast centre with enough electricity to power 10,000 homes and deploying some 20,000 military, police and private security personnel. Few cities can do that. Even fewer can do it without a significant loss. Even fewer want to give it a go. And post 9-11, there are other issues too. Security, for example. So in Rio, they had 85,000 troops, military troops, police, uh, police and others who were on the streets using tanks, using modern military equipment, and it's a very, very repressive atmosphere. And the repression can start long before the Games. A significant issue is land. The Games have to be in or near cities, but cities are full of people. Beijing, I think, set a record because they reportedly, I didn't count them myself, but several reports said that 1.5 million people, 1.5 million people, were thrown out of their homes. It all adds up and up and up. The greatest event in sport now finds itself loved, competed at, but not competed for. Winning at the Olympics is still one of the greatest prizes in all of sport. But hosting the Olympics? The Olympics is conceived of and is still supposed to be an event honouring the best athletes of the world. It's not supposed to be a construction event. It's become a construction event. Uh, we have to move away from that as, as the basic concept for the IOC model. And, um, you know, hopefully the, the economic circumstances and, and the political reaction to those circumstances will push the IOC and the sponsors of the IOC in a direction that makes that change happen. That's sports economist Andrew Zimbalis. Absolutely fascinating. So... Uh, Paris and LA have said, yeah, we'll do the next two, and then no sign of any interest from anyone after that. A Christchurch woman who strangled her boyfriend to death with a computer cable after an argument about trust issues has been sentenced to more than six years in prison. Zara J. Sampson pleaded guilty on Tuesday to the manslaughter of her boyfriend of seven weeks, 30-year-old Corey James Protoss in 2014. The 25-year-old was sentenced at the High Court in Christchurch today. Our reporter Maya Burry was there. The court heard today how Corey Protoss had been at a house in central Christchurch in April 2014 when Zaria Sampson became agitated with him and accused him of spreading rumours about her. He was then covered with a blanket with his hands bound behind his back before Sampson punched and kicked him during a sporadic four-hour-long assault. Justice Manda said Sampson then drove Protoss back to her Brindwa home where he had a shower before the argument continued. Inflicted a superficial cut to Mr Protoss's neck before wrapping a computer cable three times around his neck with which you strangled Mr Protoss, caused his death. Then wrapped Mr Protoss in a blanket and pushed him underneath the bed. You sent a text message to an associate stating you were cleaning up your mess, requested cleaning products, petrol. Sampson had earlier been facing a murder charge for killing Mr Protoss, but that was downgraded to manslaughter. Her defence lawyer, Jonathan Eaton QC, says his client didn't mean for Mr Protoss to die when she wrapped the computer cord around his neck. She didn't mean for Corey to die. She didn't contemplate that he could die as a result of it. Um, but of course she has to take responsibility and live with the fact that her actions led um, to his death. Um, we know that um, she then went home to her father and went to the police station the next day and confessed. In his sentencing remarks, Justice Manda said Sampson spiralled out of control and had been abusing drugs in the weeks before she killed Protoss after her three children were taken away from her by their father. He said the 25-year-old's upbringing had been difficult. You were born into a dysfunctional gang family and subjected to drugs and both physical and sexual assault from a young age. You had to deal with the suicide of your mother when you were aged 14 years. Your experiences as a young person had a, profound, a profoundly negative effect on you. 
Justice Manda said Sampson was remorseful for Mr Protoss's death and had written a letter to his family. Outside court, Corey's father, Jim Protoss, said he has been living a nightmare since he learnt of his son's death through Facebook. Our lives changed forever on the 28th of April 2014 when we found out our whole while on holiday in Phuket via Facebook comments that our son had been brutally murdered in Christchurch. Our beautiful son has gone forever, brutally murdered, without even a chance to defend himself. Jim Protoss said his family was disgusted that the murder charge had been reduced to one of manslaughter and justice had not been served. But he said he hoped Samson got help and turned her life around. We really do hope that Zaria does get her life back on track for herself, for her children and family. This would at least shine some light on our darkness. Sampson was sentenced to six years and three months in prison, with a minimum non-parole period of three years and three months. Corey Protoss's family are expected to attend a restorative justice meeting with Sampson at Christchurch Women's Prison next week. In Christchurch for Checkpoint, Maya Burry. Nine and a half to six, the Eating Disorder Association is preparing for an influx of people reaching out for help with today's release of the Netflix film, To the Bone. The chief censor has given it an RP16 rating, meaning anyone under the age of 16, under the age of 16, who wants to watch it should do so with a parent or guardian. Laura Tupo reports. All right, ready? 280 for the pork, 350 for the buttered noodles, 150 for the roll, and 75. Or butter. It's like you have calorie Asperger's. To the Bone follows the journey of 20-year-old Alan, played by Lily Collins, who's also suffered from an eating disorder. Netflix says Alan has anorexia nervosa and goes on a harrowing, sometimes funny journey of self-discovery at a group home run by an unusual doctor. The chief censor, David Shanks, says it comes with the warning, shows realistic, harmful behaviour with risk of imitation. Roger Mishlevitz is one of the leading experts on eating disorders and runs a private specialist clinic in Auckland. He says the fact the protagonist lost weight with a film and has had an eating disorder in the past sends a very problematic message. The one behaviour, weight loss or dieting, that someone with anorexia should definitely await those genes should stay away from. So that already in itself is of concern uh, because in some ways it sort of like sends the message, uh, you, know, you can do that and be okay. She possibly might be okay, but it's definitely sort of like a like risk behaviour. The president of the not-for-profit Eating Disorders Association of New Zealand, Nikki Wilson, says the phone has already been ringing hot after the release of the To The Bone trailer. Many calls from people who are expressing their dismay and, and distress and concern about the impact that the trailer has already had on, on them directly or on somebody that they're caring for. Nikki Wilson says hundreds of people access its services each year and the indication is that the access to evidence-based treatment isn't good enough. People are either being turned away due to not being sick enough or uh, treatment not working for them. Treatment does fail patients. We need more options and we need better treatment and better access to treatment. Our understanding is that there is not enough of a service out there for people, and that is largely about information and training and education. Ms Wilson says the film's release may increase the demand on public services, which is concerning because of the numbers of people already accessing their not-for-profit service. Ministry of Health statistics show over the past five years, people accessing specialist eating disorder services has risen from 934 in 2012 to 1,356 in 2014 and 2015, and it's dropped slightly to 1,289 last year, nearly half of whom are 19 years or younger. Both the Auckland District Health Board and the Capital and Coast District Health Board refuse to comment on this story. Nikki Wilson says anyone who wants to watch the film and is in a vulnerable position should view it with a support person. She says it's important to note that not all people who are recovering from anorexia are thin, white, young women. But she says it's important to know that full recovery is possible. Motihotaka o ko Laura Tupouaho.
Just gone six minutes to six. If you're a regular listener or watcher, you would have heard us or seen us talk about the Jensen's quite a bit over the past week or so. The American-born family of six sold up their life in the States and moved to Wellington four years ago, where they bought a cafe and turned it into a profitable and valued part of their community. Even though they employed several staff, Immigration New Zealand said the cafe wasn't profitable enough and refused to renew their visas. The Jensen's have appealed. That's on Associate Minister of Immigration Scott Simpson's desk, but he's yet to make a decision. They flew from Wellington to Auckland, and then Zach Fleming caught up with them at the departure gate in Auckland this afternoon, just before they boarded their flight to Houston. Hey, so Steve, when I was standing here with the camera, yep. someone came up to me and said, why are you here? Like, is someone famous coming through? And I explained your situation. <laughs> he was um, a construction worker, and he said to me, that's so weird. Why are they being asked to leave? And you're essentially, you own a business that employs people and it's profitable, but you're being asked to leave. How, how do you feel now being so close? Like, this is the end of the road, potentially. Yeah, this is, uh, right now, it's the end of the chapter. Um, it, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. The, the worst part is, you know, just what we did now. We left, my kids left their friends, and that was really difficult to watch. Um, we've been here four years and nearly and, and enjoyed every minute of it. And, you know, when you see your, you see your, your boys do the haka and you see your daughters sing the national anthem in Modi, you, you just you feel like you're part of the community. And now it just feels like we've had that ripped out. So, yeah, it's been hard. It feels kind of weird for me to be standing here talking to you guys about immigration given that so much of the news over the last couple of months has been about your country's immigration <laughs> and kicking people out and now I'm a New Zealander standing here and you know you own a business. Is that ironic for you? Oh yeah I think it's quite ironic I didn't realize that was going to be in my face but I yeah it is um, but I always was saying to people that we respect what the citizens of New Zealand uh, want for their country. So um, for us to say anything negative about what's happened seems a little bit out of, um, I don't know, alignment, I guess. Um, but the backing that we've gotten from just regular Kiwis, just, uh, just our friends and um, amazing customers has been, I think people that's the true, yeah, the people who know us, that's a true heart. Um, yeah, we, I see it differently. I see the whole thing differently now. Um, it's about the people. Yeah. How you guys have been treated. Do you even want to come back if the decision is that you can, do you think you will? Yes. Yes. I mean, I could go on, say yes again, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. Is New it, Zealand's been really good to us. Is it the same for all you guys as well? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Cool. Do you have one last message for ah. Scott Simpson? <laughs> uh, I'm not qualified to judge what he has to do. I just know that, to me, it would have been nice to have a personal touch. Um, they have to look at things in black and white and to me this wasn't a black and white issue. We didn't meet their goals for what they said or what they wanted for GST. I understand that, I really do. They don't want people to drain from the system. But a personal touch would have, would have hopefully shown them that we're more than just a dollar sign. You're not really a drain, you employ hard working people and run a working business. What about you guys, do you have a, a final message for, for Scott Simpson? Oh. Um, well, personally I would say just I pray and hope that this wouldn't happen to anyone else. Just because I would hate for anyone else to feel the way I feel now, and having to leave their friends and families and loved ones. So, yeah, that's the one message. Zach Fleming with the Jensen's as they were leaving for Houston uh, this afternoon from Auckland Airport. Lots of feedback coming in this evening. Thank you. Very busy feedback evening for a. Friday night, a delightful email from uh, a listener of Hanganui saying that uh, she, I think I've lost the email, but I think it was a she who's having a glass of red wine and listening to Nona and really enjoys Nona and Giles talking about business and would like them to explain the fundamentals. I think it's a really good idea. So I will suggest some kind of podcast or something, although they work very hard, our business team. It's a small team and they're stretched, but it's a lovely suggestion. Resilience and infrastructure. How is it that a bad winter's day takes... 10,000 homes 
uh, off the power grid. We get winter every year. People constantly point out that we cover winter as if it were an unusual event, and it's a fair point. So why isn't our infrastructure also more prepared for it? Well, hi, John, in terms of inf infrastructure, there's no way that New Zealand can be compared to Denmark. Transport links to Germany and the rest of Europe are funded in large part by the EU. NZ does not have a neighbouring population of 250 million people to help fund infrastructure, says Bruce. And good evening, says Terry. I'm happy to contribute more to, more to infrastructure if the service provider did not send their profits offshore, i.e. Wellington Electricity. As for uh, the Olympics and where they go, given the inability of most cities to stage them and to afford to stage them, overwhelming feedback from you that they should simply return to Greece. Of course, Athens has had them, so the infrastructure is there in some form or other. I don't know about the maintenance and upkeep, but email after email, text after text is saying, send them back to Greece and stage them there. Thank you for being in touch. We're coming up to six o'clock. RNZ News at 6. Ngamihi Nui, good evening. Ko Katrina Baton Thene. Australia's Deputy Greens leader Scott Ludlam is resigning from Parliament after realising he holds New Zealand citizenship and was not eligible for election. Mr Ludlam has served as a Western Australian Senator for nine years. He was born in Palmerston North but moved to Australia when he was three and was naturalised there in his teens. He says he only discovered in the past week that he still holds New Zealand citizenship. The Australian Constitution disqualifies potential candidates from election to the Australian Parliament if they hold dual or plural citizenship. Under the rules, Mr Ludlam should have renounced his New Zealand citizenship before he was nominated for selection. He's apologised for what he says was his mistake. I've got no wish to draw out uh, legal uncertainty or create any kind of lengthy dispute, particularly when that section of the Constitution is so clear. So I'm resigning as a Senator for Western Australia. Scott Ludlam. The High Court is now expected to determine how Mr Ludlam's Senate spot will be filled. Motorists are now able to travel through the middle of the North Island with most highways reopened except for the desert road. Snow is still being cleared there. However, the transport agency says freezing temperatures are expected overnight. A spokesperson, Karen Boyd, says motorists need to drive to the conditions and expect to see crews still working on the roads. She says a lot of people will be trying to use the roads after the long closures, so drivers need to be patient. The owner of the Rusty Nail Backpackers, Jenny Cordwell in Taihape, says she had to be resourceful while the town was cut off by road and without power. Getting the fires all going and collecting water from what was left in my tanks and things and then melting snow in pots on top of the fireplaces so that can be used for um, toilets and things um, and just making sure that you keep everyone warm and yeah, just warm and fed and fueled. Jenny Cordwell from Atahepe Backpackers. In Wairarapa, the owner of a cafe in Martinborough says trucks with supplies for her business have been unable to get through because of flooding closing nearby roads. It's impossible to get into town via State Highway 53, with floodwaters completely covering the Waihinga Bridge. The owner of Oh My Goodness Cafe on the main road, Gina Richards, got wind that the town might be cut off, so instead of going home to Featherston last night, she stayed in town. Knowing that I wouldn't be able to get in into town this morning to, to open the business, so I didn't take that risk. There's always places like to stay in that, so that is not a major. I stayed at friends' house around, around the corner, so it worked out well. Gina Richards says there's been heaps of flooding and the fire brigade in the town has been flat out. Motorists blocked by a fire on a truck carrying hazardous materials are frustrated that trucks were put at the front of the queue when the Picton Christchurch Highway reopened this afternoon. Firefighters were called to the blaze on State Highway 7 about 8 o'clock this morning and nearby Boyle Village was evacuated as a precaution. The road reopened at 2 o'clock. One motorist, Karen Kilty, says trucks were waved ahead of other drivers, which wasn't fair on travellers during the school holidays. Ms Kilty says she and her family, who were travelling to Nelson on holiday, were stuck for more than four hours. Winston Peters says while he feels sorry for the way Nationals' Todd Barclay has been treated by his party, the young MP must return to Parliament if he wants to keep getting paid. 
Last month, Mr Barclay, the MP for Clutha Southland, announced he would not seek re-election in September after the police reopened their investigation into whether he secretly recorded staff in his electorate office. The National Party senior whip, Jamie Lee Ross, says no decisions has, have been made about whether Mr Barclay will return to Parliament for the four remaining sitting weeks before the election. The New Zealand First leader, Winston Peters, thinks Mr Barclay has been very poorly treated by his colleagues. But that said, you know, there's not one law for the National Party that's different law for everybody else. If you're picking up a taxpayer's largesse for a job, you have to do that job unless you've got a darn good reason like illness or family bereavement or good reason not to be there. And the National Party should ensure he does that. Winston Peters' repeated attempts by RNZ to contact Todd Barclay this week have been unsuccessful. Two Romanian men have been arrested over a range of crimes, including immigration offences. The pair, aged 34 and 40, were due to appear in the Auckland District Court this afternoon. The police say they're key figures in a large international organised crime group involved in credit card skimming and the production of false identities. They're facing charges including participating in an organised crime group, provision of false or misleading information, using forged documents and misleading an immigration officer. The arrests were the result of a joint effort involving customs and immigration. It's five past six. In sport, the Warriors face a crucial National Rugby League encounter with the Penrith Panthers in Auckland tonight. Both sides are fighting for a playoff spot with both sitting four points adrift of the top eight. Warriors halfback Sean Johnson says the team is under no illusions about the importance of the match. We've spoken about it, we understand that this is a very important game for both teams. You know, they're in a very similar position to us, so we want to really enjoy that challenge. Get excited to play back here. Yeah, I'm just going to slowly build into the game, get really excited for it's going to be awesome. Tonight's match has added significance with the club honouring departing winger Manu Vatave. The New Zealand golfer Lydia Ko is looking to build on her strong start in the second round of the US Open in New Jersey. The world number four sits third after an opening round 68, two shots behind the leader, China's Shansheng Feng. Ko says bogeys are inevitable at the Trump National Course and the key is not to let them affect her game. You have to stay patient and you know, have to stay positive uh, and you know, really focus on those points and not get too carried away you know, about those bogeys because you know, it is very likely that you're going to make a couple along the way. Lydia Ko. New Zealand basketballer Corey Webster has made a solid contribution in his latest game for the Dallas Mavericks at the NBA Summer League in Las Vegas. Webster scored eight points and had three rebounds, two assists and two steals in the Mavericks' 83-76 win over the Sacramento Kings. The 28-year-old has been released from his Australian NBL contract with the Perth Wildcats to pursue overseas opportunities. That's the news. Tomorrow morning, Joan Withers on why she's still a member of a minority when it comes to boardrooms. It's 70 years since Dior's first fashion collection. The new look, it became known as. Katie Somerville's been curating a House of Dior exhibition in Melbourne. And Emma Ng on anti-Asian prejudice in New Zealand. Join me, Kim Hill, tomorrow morning from 8 on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow, Northland. Showers mainly in the west, easing this evening. Auckland, Coromandel, Bay of Plenty and Taupo. Remaining rain, clearing this evening, but skies remaining mostly cloudy. Waikato to Waitomo, also Taumiranui. Fine breaks increasing. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, rain with heavy falls and snow above 600 metres, easing to showers from the south this evening, increasing fine spells tomorrow. Taranaki to Wellington, also Taihepe and Wairarapa. Showers gradually easing today and clearing tomorrow morning. Marlborough and Canterbury, areas of cloud and isolated showers, mainly about the coast, clearing overnight and becoming fine. Nelson Bola, Westland and Fiordland, mainly fine. However, isolated showers for Westland and rain for Fiordland later tomorrow. Otago and Southland, fine apart from a few showers in Southland tomorrow night and occasional showers for the Chatham Islands. It's eight past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you so much, Katrina. We have just received a copy of the interim report and recommendations of the panel following the hearing in the matter of the government inquiry into Havelock North drinking 
water. Now, we all know, of course, what we are talking about here. This is the report into the Havelock North drinking contamination that made thousands of people sick last year. The hearings were held uh, on between the 27th and 29th uh, of June. The interim report has been released this afternoon. I'm a bit surprised we're only just getting a copy of it now and I've no idea why. So we're just sitting here going through the raw. The purpose of the hearing was to consider two of the issues identified as part of the stage two investigation, namely the current safety of Havelock North drinking water, which obviously is very important if you drink that water, and drinking water partnerships and collaborations. The inquiry panel considers that Given the circumstances currently existing in relation to both Brookvale Bore 3 and the Hastings Bore, it is unwise to rely on the secure classification of the DWSNZ. That's Drinking Water Standards New Zealand. It's unwise to rely on the secure classification. Now, my initial reading of that is that that has big implications for that classification as it is implied, applied throughout the country. Uh, it goes on to make recommendations. All bores from the Hastings District draws water for supply to Havelock North. Sorry, all bores from which the Hastings District Council draws drinking water for supply to Havelock North or Hastings be managed as non-secure and potentially subject to the influence of surface water and or the risk of contamination from defects in the sewage system. So, all bores in the Hastings District are regarded now as non-secure which is pretty extraordinary for drinking water in New Zealand. The monitoring and testing of the Havelock North and Hastings drinking water supplies to be subject to the following regime. Two litre raw water samples will be taken daily from each bore, contributing to the supply of Havelock North drinking water. Uh, testing and monitoring for protozoa shall be carried out at each bore bi-weekly using 1,000 litre samples until the end of the year. These tests should also be carried out on three consecutive days after an abnormal wet weather event. Well, we've just had one of those. So the initial reading is that the secure classification in relation to bores is probably not as binding as we might hope and that the water that Havelock North is drawing from bores is regarded as insecure and must be frequently tested. We're trying to talk to people about this. I have no idea why we've just got a copy of it this time on a Friday night. And if we can get someone to explain more and elaborate and tell us what all this means, we will get back to you immediately. Now, as we heard earlier in the program, major job losses are on the cards at Otago University. The figure being proposed is 182 full-time equivalent jobs, and given part-time staff, job sharing and so on, that's likely to be significantly more than 182 people. Efficiencies are being sought, including greater provision of university-wide support services rather than department by department. But in Dunedin, where Cadbury is laying off 300 people, more jobs going is meaningfully bad news, obviously. The proposal doesn't yet have names and actual positions attached to it, but Pam Gemmett, an administrator in the Humanities Department, is among those in positions from which the job losses will come. Today, she was at a large staff meeting to hear the university's vice-chancellor explain what's being sought and why. The rationale that's been given is that we've got too much duplication, too many people doing similar things, jobs that are titled one thing or another doing the same work but at different levels of pay. Um, the need to rationalise space, the need to spend money wisely, to have a pool of money that's available for strategic initiatives, that sort of thing, has been the rhetoric behind it. But underlying that has been right back at the beginning was that, that Otago is seen to be oversupported. They did a, um, they were part of a uniform process, and that showed data across several universities here and in Australia. And we tended to come out worse off. But I suppose looking at, at, at that data doesn't really show the full picture because we support our students better. We get students who keep coming to Otago because they are supported. So, you know, you, there's a counter-argument to that. But the bottom line is that the university needs to save money. You work uh, at, at a national level with the PSA, is that right? Um, well, I'm employed by the university, but as part of my role as a PSA member, I, I, got, um, I took on the role of the tertiary convener, so right, okay. I'm Thank, the Otago rep yeah, on that group. Right, thank you. And can you talk to me about the sense of pressures on universities 
to be more like businesses, to rationalise, to cut costs, to do vocational courses, the sorts of pressures that you have a sense of being applied across the board now? Well, it's interesting that I had an audio conference with a group of um, some people in a similar position to mine saying that in their universities they're going through a lot of restructuring, a lot of um, cost-cutting. People have you know, gone through months and months of low morale where they're not quite sure of what's happening. But more and more you're seeing the business model approach because we're quite clearly competing with Auckland for student numbers. And so what are, the, what are they doing in Auckland to, to, to get that money? They're, they're cutting costs and services here, there and everywhere. And so it's a model that's being applied here. And in, in University of Melbourne is another one that's been cited as a good example for how to manage the business better. So yes, it is very much, in my view, looking at now we've gone beyond being a, an education that's funded by government to one that's really looking at the business model approach, even though they're not making a profit at the end of it, but they are certainly trying to cut costs. So it leaves you with 182 jobs at the moment anyway. That's the figure being said, stated publicly, uh, to be lost. And, yep. and, and you are amongst the people those job losses will come from. What will you do, Pam, if, if it's you? And forgive me for what really seems a crassly insensitive question at this stage of the process, but will you stay in Dunedin? What, um, jobs are difficult to find in that city now, particularly in the academic world. What, what would you do? Oh, well, there are, you know, the market in Dunedin is very small, as you know. I mean, we we just lost a whole lot of staff from, well, we haven't lost them yet, but will from Cadbury. So they're, they're going to be looking for jobs at the, in December. The university are planning to, to cut these jobs. Well, we're looking at March probably before they start slashing and burning. But really, we, we're, not, we, we're a regional centre now. We don't have the big infrastructure that you have in the likes of Auckland, Wellington or Christchurch where there's a, you know, the market for jobs is, is greater. We're, we're very limited in, in jobs that that are equivalent to what I'm doing at the university. For I know it's an administration function, but, you know, it's quite specific to a university. And, the, and those tr skills are transferable, but you have to transfer them to somewhere. And one of the guys at the meeting today actually made a really good point when we were all sitting in the, all of the staff that were, attended the Dunedin session were sitting in the auditorium, he made a really valid point that a third of those people were going to not be around. So I thought that was extremely poignant. That's Pam Jennett, who is, uh, Jemmett, who is a uh, administrator in the Humanities Department at the University of Otago in Dunedin, 16 and a half past six. Weeks after announcing he was pulling the US out of the Paris Climate Agreement, Donald Trump has hinted that he might have a change of heart. The US president is in Paris at the invitation of French President Emmanuel Macron. He and his wife Melania have been the focus of a charm and sightseeing offensive, but he was forced to take questions about his eldest son's controversial meeting with a Russian lawyer who'd been promised damaging information on Hillary Clinton during last year's presidential election campaign. This report from the BBC's Lucy Williamson. Emmanuel Macron welcomed Donald Trump today with a visit to the tomb of France's grand military leader, Napoleon. The impressive location designed to flatter both visitor and host. Both these two men see themselves as modern-day political revolutionaries, sweeping away the old rules and expectations. But Mr Macron also sees nothing wrong with using France's imperial history and military might to put its current diplomatic relations in context. The two men have been battling for the role of alpha male ever since their first handshake on the sidelines of a G7 summit. Donald Trump later pulled out of a key climate change deal brokered in Paris, prompting Mr. Macron to issue a video parodying the US president's campaign slogan. Make our planet great again. But Mr. Macron, keen to boost French influence abroad, has since turned on the charm. And Mr. Trump's comments today on climate change suggest it might be working. Something could happen with respect to the Paris Accord. We'll see what happens. But uh, we will talk about that over the coming period of time. And if it happens, that'll be wonderful. And if it doesn't, that'll be 
okay too. I want to continue discussions with the US and President Trump on this very important subject. I respect the wish to preserve jobs. I think it's compatible in the Paris Agreement. Now we have to let the US work on its roadmap and to continue talking with them. And amid allegations that Russia interfered in the US election, Mr. Trump was also asked about his son's contact with a Russian lawyer last year. I have a son who is a great young man. He's a fine person. He took a meeting with a lawyer from Russia. Uh, it lasted for a very short period, and nothing came of the meeting. And I think it's a meeting that most people in politics probably would have taken. Today, no differences were allowed to mar the transatlantic ties. But what do French voters think of Mr. Trump's visit? I don't like him much, but what, what do I have to say? He's not my president. Thank God. <laughs> Trying to understand where what he wants and where he's going is not a bad idea, even if he does not appreciate him as a person or what he stands for. So I think French diplomacy at its best. In a visit where symbolism was the substance, the two couples dined tonight at the Eiffel Tower, a place labelled pragmatic rather than pretty, to cement an alliance imperfect but crucial to France's place in the world. Lucy Williamson also making headlines during the trip was Donald Trump's comments to Emmanuel Macron's wife, Brigitte, on meeting her. He said, you know, you're in such great shape, beautiful. And in the battle between the alpha males, when Donald Trump and Emmanuel Macron first met, they shook hands for a firm 10 seconds. 20 past six, China's most prominent political dissident and only Nobel Peace Laureate has died after being died, denied permission to leave the country for uh, treatment for late stage liver cancer. Liu Xiaobo was 61. The Chinese government revealed he had cancer just two weeks ago and only after the illness was virtually uh, beyond treatment. The Nobel Committee says China bears a heavy responsibility for his premature death. The BBC's China correspondent Carrie Gracie has this report. Two foreign doctors were allowed to visit his bedside. The pictures released abroad to support the government's claim that it had done what it could, along with videos to deflect the charge that his cancer was neglected until too late. But he was denied his dying wish to leave China. We have been through these kind of cases one after another, but it still come as a big shock because not only because I know him, but also because he has been a, such a symbol for China's human rights or democratic movement. Liu Xiaobo's course was set in 1989, the Tiananmen Square democracy protests. He tried to secure students' safe passage out before the army moved in to kill unknown numbers. Many gave up, but he stood firm. In and out of jail for demanding political freedoms. As a survivor of the Tiananmen Square democracy movement, I feel I have a duty to uphold justice for those who died in that event. 20 years have passed. In 2010, he won the Nobel Peace Prize but he was back in prison for subversion. Empty chair became a banned expression on China's internet. His once irrepressible wife, Liu Xia, was placed under house arrest, where she fell victim to depression. It was only two weeks ago the world learned of Liu Xiaobo's illness. Hong Kong, the one place in China citizens could call for his release. Chinese censorship is formidable, and few here know of Liu Xiaobo's life, his death, or his Nobel Peace Prize. Many Chinese see the one-party state as an unavoidable fact of life, and under the strongman rule of President Xi Jinping, it's become even more dangerous to challenge that. Liu Xiaobo once warned, if you want to enter hell, don't complain of the dark. He felt no ill will towards his jailers. He said he'd committed no crime, but had no complaints. The BBC's 
carry Gracie on an extraordinary life. 23 and a half past six. The Labour Party wants to pay early childhood centres more money if they employ more qualified teachers. Its early childhood policy announced today also sets a requirement for all centres to ensure 80% of their teachers are qualified. By the end of 2020, the policy reverses cuts and changes the national-led government introduced in 2010 and 2011. Our education correspondent, John Gerritsen, filed this report. The more qualified teachers an early childhood centre has, the higher its rate of subsidy. But since 2011, there's been no financial incentive to go beyond 80% qualified teachers because the subsidy rate stops there. Labor's Chris Hipkin says his party would change that by reinstating a rate for centres where all teachers are qualified and registered. The Labor Party is going to drive an increase in the quality of early childhood education by introducing a higher funding rate for services that employ fully qualified and registered teachers. We used to have that higher funding rate and the national government cut it when they came into office. We're going to reinstate it and make sure that those services that are delivering the highest quality education are financially rewarded for doing that. Chris Hipkins says the new rate is likely to be in line with a recent Infometrics report for the Educational Institute, which suggested about 80 cents more per child per hour than the current top rate. He says a Labour-led government will also introduce a requirement that by the end of 2020, 80% of the staff in teacher-led early childhood centres must be qualified teachers. The sector itself is already very close to or around the 80% registered teacher mark now, but it's very unevenly spread. So you've got many services employing 100% qualified staff and, and really struggling to meet the financial commitment of that. But then you do have a number of other services that are down around the 50% mark. Mr Hipkins says the policies will cost about $190 million over their first three years. The president of the Educational Institute, Linda Stewart, says early childhood centres have been struggling to pay for fully qualified staffing teams since the top rate was removed. And she says too many services have less than 80% qualified teachers. Across the country, we are well below the 80%. That's been happening over some considerable time now since the target of 100% was dropped in 2010. So we're seeing a decrease in qualified registered teachers who are working with these younger children. The Chief Executive of the Early Childhood Council, Peter Reynolds, says its members would prefer the government to return to ensuring early childhood teachers get the same pay rises as kindergarten teachers. That stopped in 2011 and since then there's been four kindergarten teacher pay increases, 4%, 4%, 0.38% and most recently 2%. So now we've got a situation where teachers are pitted against teachers in our sector effectively doing the same job, but as a result of government intervention, being paid quite differently. Peter Reynolds says early childhood subsidies need to increase because services are getting about $100,000 less per year than they were in 2011. For Checkpoint, John Gerritsen. 26 and a half past six, the owner of a scaffolding company has offered a job to a man who's struggling to get work because of a prison tattoo covering half his face. It's quite a distinctive tattoo. Douglas George Hebert runs PR contracting in Auckland and got in touch with Mark Kropp after his story appeared in the media. Now, Mark has a large tattoo on his face which says, Devastate with the state but being an eight, and he thinks it's holding him back now he's out of prison. Mr Hebert told our reporter Joanna McKenzie that he's offered Mark work because he knows what it's like to be down on his luck. I have a bad past, one I'm not proud of. You know, I, I come from a broken home. You know, he, he just made a couple of bad choices and, and I, I wish I had a, had someone to, to kind of make, you know, to, to extend a hand out and be like, you know, here you go, mate. You know, we'll give you a go anyway. So I guess it's, um, you know, it just, you, I don't know. It takes, it takes, takes no effort to be, a, to be a good person, you know? So that's, I guess, my motivation behind it, yeah. And have you done this sort of thing before, taken people on who haven't had the best track record but you just felt they needed a second chance? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've had a couple guys that work for me that, you know, yeah, you know, they, they weren't the best of, best of guys. And, um, and uh you know, some of them stuck around. Others, you know, they just kind of fell back into their old routine and and um, aren't aren't working for me anymore. But there's a couple of guys that have went on to to become successful riggers and and steel directors. You know, you you get your your odd ones that kind of you know give other people a bad name. But you know, you can't let it deter you from from still seeing the good in other people. You know.
And while um, you haven't heard back from Mark Crop yet, you have um, you've heard from other people because of this who've got in touch wanting a second chance. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of guys have uh, messaged me up saying, "Hey, bro, you know, like uh, um, I'm pretty keen to, you know, I have this experience and and I just having a tough go and can't find a job at the moment." So, yeah, you know, I'll give anybody a jam, and you know, most of my guys that that work for me now. I've kind of taught right from laborers up into riggers. So it's been really good. You know, they're, they're really good workers. Um, the one guy that started off with me, Grant, is, was a real young fella. You know, didn't know rigging from, from nothing, and now is probably one of my best workers. That is Douglas George Hebert talking to Joanna McKenzie earlier this afternoon. We're going to end tonight with just a quick look back over the government inquiry into Havelock North drinking water, which she only obtained a short time ago. And the matter of government inquiry into Havelock North drinking water interim report and recommendations of the panel following that hearing, of course, that we reported on at length in June. Uh, their recommendations are basically that the water is not regarded as secure all bores from which Hastings District Council draws drinking water supply to Havelock North or Hastings be managed as non-secure and potentially subject to the influence of surface water and or the risk of contamination from defects in the sewerage system. That is the substantive recommendation. There is much more. Uh, it will be available online. Thank you for being with us and have a wonderful weekend. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. An inquiry into the Havelock North water contamination says all bores in the town are potentially at risk. The deputy leader of the Australian Greens, Scott Ludlam, has resigned from Parliament after realising he holds New Zealand citizenship. Most highways through the central North Island are now open except for the desert road. And there are warnings melting snow could push the Turakina River in the Whanganui district to alarming levels. Our next news and weather is at 7. This week on Country Life, we're talking kernels, the nutty ones, pine nuts. In total, across seven orchards now, we have about 550 hectares planted, canopy area. And, you know, we have about 550,000 trees planted. The first commercial pine nut producers in the Southern Hemisphere. To find out more, tune in to Country Life, Friday night after the news at 9.